Hi, everyone. My name is Sergey Smirnov. I'm a senior technical specialist in Microsoft and uh, Cosmos uh, Global Black Belt team. And today we're going to talk uh, about graph analytical use cases, uh, which can be solved with uh, Azure Cosmos Gremlin API and Azure Synapse using Spark Graph Frames library. So this is our agenda for today. Um, we're going to look into Azure Cosmos DB and Gremlin API. We're going to talk about transactional OLTP graphs versus analytical OLAP graphs uh, use cases and uh, how they differ from each other uh, and the challenges uh, as well. Uh, then we're going to quickly look into do a sneak peek in Azure Cosmos DB analytical store synapse link because we're going to use them, use a portion of this in, in my demo later on. And uh, <clears throat> essentially, we're going to talk about the Gremlin API Spark integration, how it's used, and uh, <clears throat> how we can use it to solve analytical OLAP graph use cases. And we're going to wrap up everything with a demo walkthrough of using Spark Graph Frames library from Synapse Spark uh, to explore graph analytical use cases uh, on top of Cosmos DB Gremlin API data. So first thing, Azure Cosmos DB. This is a NoSQL database, which is uh, positioned for modern applications, which has uh, SLA back speed availability, automatic instance scalability, and, and uh, multiple open source APIs for different NoSQL uh, patterns. We guarantee new speed at any scale. Uh, we simplify application development with multiple SDKs for your schemaless data. Uh, we are mission critical ready. We guarantee you business continuity with Jira replication, five nines availability, enterprise level security, and we are fully managed and cost effective. Uh, uh, we give you that uh, different modes of provisioning with serverless and I make scale in to match your application needs. Uh, what is Cosmos DB uh, undercover? Uh, we have different APIs for different use cases, uh, table for key value store, Cassandra for column family, core SQL API and Mongo API with document, uh, uh, document database. And we have graph API for, uh, <clears throat> Gremlin API for graph use cases. All those APIs are served uh, undercover uh, by Azure Cosmos DB platform, and they all have the same guarantees of global distribution, elastic scale out, same low latency guarantees, and same SLAs. But today we're going to focus on Gremlin API. Um, so if we zoom into architecture of Cosmos DB Gremlin API, currently uh, it is uh, using the Azure Cosmos DB partition storage, basically horizontally partitioned storage based on the partition key is a uh, hash and um, uh, shards uh, to, to do the read write operation from your graph database engine, uh, which has a wire protocol support with Gremlin API based on your open source Gremlin SDKs, which is used by application. Now, what uh, does Cosmos DB Gremlin API good at? It's good at elastic scalable storage and throughput for graph data and operations. Uh, it's good at high throughput for reads and writes. Uh, it's uh, uh, good at high concurrent transactional workloads, meaning that from Gremlin perspective, you can uh, easily create uh, high volume vertices and edges uh, in your graph database. It is a fully managed platforms, uh, so you don't have the complexity of uh, managing your systems. And it gives you familiar graph technology Gremlin, which is uh, pretty popular uh, in, in the open source world for your transactional OLTP type applications to um, help out with uh, graph use cases. Where you might need a different solution approach is when you plan to run complex graph analytics, um, when you want to do machine learning the data science uh, processing on top of your graph OLTP data, when you want to do relationship discovery and resolution on the large graph databases. Uh, this is where, uh, and we're going to touch into why, why this is the case, at least right now. Uh, and this is where we recommend, in some cases, to look at the compute engine like Apache Spark, pair it with Cosmos Gremlin API to solve those use cases. Um, um, now, let's look into the a little bit of the architecture and why this would be the case. So if you look at the Azure Cosmos Gremlin API on the cover, it is horizontally partitioned graph data. So we uh, do automatic partitioning through hashing of your partition key value, um, which is one of the properties of your vertices. Um, uh, edge documents, basically your relationship edges, stored uh, within source vertex documents in same partition. So basically, um, every uh, logical partition key will have the uh, vertex and all its edges. 
And each uh, partition is 20 gigabyte in size and has 10,000 request unit throughput cap capacity. Um, why we say the, there is uh, not a good fit for uh, current Gremlin API for analytical queries is because every edge is charged as document as well. And there is RU implications for analytical type queries. Uh, in large graph traversals where there is many edges where you want to do bi-directional traversals or multi-levels uh, walkthroughs with aggregations on top of it, it often become expensive while graph is flexible to be able to do it, uh, but it become expensive from compute operation uh, to, to do aggregation on them. Uh, and this is where the Spark is an attractive alternative for scalable compute and memory architecture. To give an example, if this is the simplest graph where Sergey knows Michael, Alexei, and Rick, all right? So we have uh, four vertices and three edges. To do the simple query, we need seven or use uh, because we visit in four vertices and three edges um, with the point lookups. Uh, but if you pretend that this is, uh, uh, Sergey knows now million of people now that uh, query become millionaire use. And if that million becomes, let's say we want to do like a three level traversal, uh, you can quickly uh, run into scalability challenges uh, from compute perspective. If let's say we want to do aggregation at every level. Uh, now let's look at what are common graph analytical all up use cases. So there is, uh, this is not all inclusive, but this is representative sample. Uh, there is several scenarios, and the first one is materialized traversals. You often use in fraud detection where you walk the graph and obtain analyzed values for each hub. Um, they're often used in relationship discovery. Uh, for example, real-time recommendation engines and document linking analysis where you scan graph where, you, for example, you you don't know about all relationships. You have some relationship in your graph, but you want to discover hidden relationships where um, um, <clears throat> for example, when you do like uh, master data management or uh, trying to link uh, not directly related data with additional type of references, you first want to discover this and uh, create additional those additional edges with additional properties for querying later. Um, large complex aggregations, uh, usually in supply chain management, logistics analytics, uh, for example, give me a sum of all properties of all edges connected to this vertex by a certain number of levels. Um, and complex graph computations uh, where like we're doing inventory and network tracking discovery or community management or fraud detection. This is where there is a bunch of graph algorithms uh, like large breadth first uh, uh, search, large shortest path computation, cycle detections, et cetera, uh, ranking <coughs> where you actually apply <coughs> statistical analysis on groups of graphs and, and uh, edges to produce some uh, uh, ratings and rankings, which you can then <clears throat> either present downstream or update existing properties to be used as additional filters for your uh, traditional OLTP queries. And a lot of times this goes hand in hand with your OLTP graph, which is still used for serving, uh, but you need to run those analytics once in a while and update the either downstream different systems or update the same graph. <clears throat> If we look at the Gremlin API scenarios, how this all fits together, um, current Gremlin API is best suited for scenarios that make transactional graph operations traversals, but can adapt to analytical scenarios through the native Apache Spark connectors. So in this picture is Cosmos Gremlin API is in the middle and we can serve Gremlin OLTP queries through our regular Gremlin API, but we can also serve um, graph OLAP queries uh, through uh, Apache Spark, whether it's it's reading graph documents from Cosmos DB, doing that processing, and then it has a choice either write some data back to Gremlin API. Let's say I want to create additional edges based on discovery, or maybe I do the aggregations and I am going to push down to presentation layer like Power BI reports, where because a lot of times the actual reporting on graph data not always uh, in in graph format. It it often become a tabular format, just like any, any other reporting. Uh, how can we do this? Uh, so we can do this because we have a unique uh, capability in Gremlin API uh, um, where we have uh, different endpoints uh, available, sorry, uh, available uh, for the same uh, data store. 
So on the back end, uh, Cosmos Gremlin API using the same Cosmos partition storage and represent Gremlin data as graphson format where we uh, store um, uh, store uh, vertices and edges documents uh, based in graphson format. Uh, and uh, it allow us to represent the same document for as a graph, uh, as a vertex or edge to Gremlin API, but we can also query the data using uh, dot, .NET SQL API uh, for SQL API SDK, and you can use them both interchangeably in your application. To illustrate that example, let me show you one thing. This is uh, a simple graph of France, which is often used in uh, small demos. And if we look at the data itself uh, in uh, uh, Gremlin format, this is a representation of the vertices. Uh, we can also query the same data using our SQL API. Um, if we select everything here, we can look at the same data here. So we have the same representation where we have label, we have a uh, vertex ID, and then for each property, we have a name and the value represented with a unique ID and some, um, um, and some internal Cosmos DB attributes. Uh, the edges are represented, if we scroll down to the bottom, Edges are represented as well with a label, edge ID, and then we have pairs of sync and vertex uh, properties where we define in the sync. Um, sync ID is a ID of the vertex where the sync is, uh, sync label partition, and also the vertex ID uh, because this is where the uh, edge is stored. And then we have that is edge property true because that's how we can actually differentiate the edges when we query stuff. Coming back uh, to our presentation, uh, let's now look at uh, Cosmos DB analytical store synapse link because this is we actually going to take leverage in our demo, and this is one of the differentiator for Cosmos DB, uh, where we have transactional data. Let's say this transactional graph, uh, as you do in your CRUD operations, um, we can represent it for analytical store using the auto sync, um, and then that analytical store can be using Azure synapse link to Brin is a Spark or SQL uh, query engines to do the analytical uh, operations on top of it and expose it for uh, other downstream use cases. Right now, the analytical store is not available for Gremlin API itself from Cosmos DB. Uh, it's only available for SQL API and Mongo API, but we can still take advantage of that uh, native integration and Azure Synapse link to avoid the uh, downstream propagation and security ma key management, et cetera. And this is what we're going to use. Um, lastly, let's look into uh, Spark part of it, right? So we're saying that Apache Spark is uh, recommended or, or or can be positioned for, to solve those problems. So how that it that it works together? So Cosmos Gremlin Spark integration is usually based on uh, open source Spark graph libraries. It's uh, the two common ones are GraphFrames and NetworkX, uh, and our Cosmos Spark connector. So we'll use Spark Connector to connect to that uh, uh, SQL API endpoint uh, to be able to read the uh, JSON uh, documents into Spark and then uh, convert them to graph frames in Spark to operate uh, using these graph frames and network X within Spark and then produce the data set at the end to look at the results. Uh, we have some examples. I'm referencing some examples here with the links, which will be available in slides later. Um, and historically, um, this was done using managed Spark clusters like HDI or Databricks. But now, because of that Azure Synapse link, we can now use Synapse Spark tools as well to do this. And this is what we can actually use in our demo. So this is a link to the uh, demo notebook uh, you can you can use later. Um, but now we're gonna just uh, walk through through the process. So this is our Synapse uh, and uh, the first thing um, you want to do is uh, basically, if you want to implement it yourself, uh, look uh, look at the data set. This is a sample data set you need to load in your uh, uh, Gremlin API database. It represents very simple. It's usually publicly available in many references. Representing some uh, people with the first name and the age property. And then we have uh, two type of relationships, uh, friends and followers. Uh, with a label person, and this is our uh, IDs. Uh, 
uh, I expanded the data set uh, with a few additional uh, people and I created some uh, additional properties to uh, convert the data set to be more representative for analytical workloads um, and I'll illustrate why. Uh, and if you wanna look at the data set, this is what it looks like uh, if we just re-execute the query. So it's it's a little convoluted. It's it's like a little spider web. So um, we're gonna use uh, graphs, uh, graph frames, uh, Spark uh, to analyze relationships between that data set. And this is a simplistic version of it. But uh, as we're gonna walk through, we can try to project what would it be if this would be a million uh, connections, or uh, let's say it's a, a uh, network operations for, or like payments, for example, between people who want to analyze it if there is a fraud green here for like money laundering, for example. All right, so let's uh, let's look at our demo. Basically, we have uh, uh, our common uh, uh, small data set. Uh, we're describing the several people with property edge, age uh, and the relationship between those people. I expanded the data set called friends. Um, you probably can find it uh, online. I expanded the data set a little bit to add additional uh, people to kind of like inject it in the network of those uh, friends and followers and create and also edit additional properties for uh, edges to simulate uh, uh, groups of people to which will discover it, which maybe not naturally observant if you look at uh, the spider web connections, right? So we'll use our graph to uh, discover this. Let me jump to uh, my graph frame. So the way we're gonna do it, we're using the graph frames uh, library, which you can add to uh, the data source um, um, ADLS and then load it to Spark using configuration. Um, this, is, this is the example. Then you would import your graph frames uh, from that library to use in, in addition to your Spark SQL function to be able to read Cosmos data using the Cosmos OLTP format, uh, using that link service, uh, this is where we mentioned Synapse link to with Cosmos Gremlin API, using that uh, SQL API endpoint, uh, and the frames would be the name of our uh, graph uh, uh, database. Um, and well, we, we'll break that uh, because it's a graph database has both documents for both vertices and edges. Uh, we need to split the data frame, uh, all of data frame into um, two different uh, uh, data frames. One is vertices where we filter in by sync as null and we uh, then subselect an ID of the vertex and the name and age property. Um, and then, uh, uh, we also um, grab in the <clears throat> edges, uh, basically reverse filter where a sync is not null, and that's how we split which documents are uh, vertices versus edges. And then we uh, select only three properties from the document because we only need three for data frame uh, uh, edges is uh, vertex ID, sync, and label, and we rename them to sort destination relationship. And down the road, this is our data frame, kind of like all our JSON columns. Once we convert it to vertices and edges, it's very nice from, from visualization standpoint because it's uh, fairly simple. You have the vertex ID and then name and the uh, value of the property. And then you have the same thing for edges where you have uh, source destination uh, IDs of your uh, vertices and the um, uh, label for, for property name for your relationship, right? So it's friends or followers. Now, next step is we would convert, uh, use a, our cleansed vertices and edges to create graph frame um, um, uh, using the graph frame. And then everything else uh, would be assigned to graph and everything else will be done based on this uh, graph frame uh, as a source. So now that we convert to graph frame, we can actually do uh, computational, um, those are simple computational operations where we do count of the uh, total count of all the objects, uh, count of the uh, vertices, count of the edges, combine them uh, to validate that this is the same. We can do some uh, uh, 
uh, some simple aggregations, like for example, find the youngest user in the graph. Uh, we can do vertices group by mean HO to show the values. We can um, count the number of uh, followers in a graph, for example, to query the edges, right? So we can break down graphs, vertices, or edges, depending on what operations we're doing with simple uh, uh, SQL-like filters or Spark, Spark SQL-like filters. Uh, the other interesting thing is what we can do, we can use uh, in degrees uh, to do the um, display of in degrees, and then we can do like additional filters and group by operations on top of it. So for example, uh, this is our representation of in degrees. I remember that when we were discussing the <clears throat> Cosmos DB Gromlin API partitioning, where we store outbound edges within the source vertices, uh, the side effect of this architecture is that inbound traversals are actually expensive because they become cross partition queries. Uh, and if you need to scan a whole graph to calculate the inbound degrees for whole graph, unless it's graph in memory, and, and uh, this is coming, but it's not available right now yet, um, <clears throat> uh, this can be a very compute and very heavy operation. And this is allowing you simple. Uh, computation of this to discover, for example, who is your most connected person. That's very, uh, very easy to uh, to calculate and show. Um, this could be, for example, used for in uh, supply chain when you do route optimization to show, or maybe like when you do um, uh, air uh, <coughs> uh, airplane uh, flights uh, route and to see what is the most connected uh, air, uh, airport. Uh, probably Chicago is, I'm from Chicago. Chicago is second most, but uh, it will be in the ballpark. It will be in top 10 for sure. Um, now let's look at the other uh, use cases here. Uh, let's look at the community detection algorithm using label propagation. So we're not gonna go with details in the label propagation, but uh, in a nutshell, what it does it detects communities or vertices based on their connections, right? So we were shown earlier like the number of connections per vertice, uh, but it doesn't show the groups of people who are connected together. Label allow you to do just this. So this is the example how to run it. Uh, we're basically defining the uh, result variable uh, where we're gonna do label propagation on our graph with uh, five iterations, right? So we wanna do several iterations like with every machine learning to get more accurate results. And we're gonna run it. And then we're gonna just uh, represent the result set uh, with ID name, name and label uh, ordered by label. And label is basically some kind of number generated by the algorithms to group things together. So when we run it, we can actually see that um, we have a bunch of people who are grouped together uh, and this is our original uh, group. And then we have uh, my other three people uh, in separate categories. They label separately because they have different connections to different people. And there is one person who is uh, absolutely different because he doesn't connect to other people. He only connected to this, this subgroup. And this is actually, you can actually see it here now if we unwind this graph, if we take Samuel here, and we move him, let's me first find him, Samuel, right? So if we stretch it, we can see that Samuel only connected to that other group through Samuel Sam, and Samuel Sam are in that separate subgroup, but everyone else is connected together. And that's that's somewhat the power of that graph analytics to do those type of discoveries. Now let's look at the other application of the uh, graph algorithm is called PageRank. PageRank is a centrality algorithm using to find importance of connected vertices. Basically, we've kind of like taken that uh, uh, group discovery to next stage uh, where we want to actually, uh, in the big groups, we want to find who is the most uh, uh, most valuable person of the uh, group based on the, <clears throat> uh, based on the connections. Uh, and then uh, there is different variations of this uh, where you can weight edges, uh, like assign different weights, uh, or you can have uh, custom weights assigned, or uh, you can uh, group them uh, with like bias towards arrays of the source IDs. So you can do like bias towards one, bias towards multiple arrays. Uh, and, and we can show, so uh, we're gonna, uh, it's actually running still right now, we just restarted it. Uh, so the first one is um, running page rank um, with uh, 
uh, reset probability, and, and those are kind of like default uh, values. Um, just just full Rankin, and then uh, we're gonna do Rankin uh, towards uh, person A, who is Alice, I believe. Uh, and then the last one was gonna rank uh, towards array of A, B, and C. So we're gonna bias towards three people. So it's executing now. So let's see when it's finished. While it's running, I'm gonna quickly walk through um, the other algorithm at the bottom where you can also use it to find shortest pass algorithm uh, using the short, shortest pass. Uh, and in the landmarks, you define uh, the pair of vertices, um, uh, which, uh, which will be used uh, to uh, define short pass. So this is not the short pass between A and C. This is a short, short pass uh, uh, to, uh, from A and C to others, right? So how they connected to others. So it's, uh, this should finish. I mean, this is, and, and this is another example why uh, you see that it's even with Spark, like I'm running with uh, two executors with four cores each, um, <clears throat> and it's still taking some time uh, because it's, uh, those algorithms are usually compute intensive and probably even in memory, running it on top of your uh, operational data may not be a good idea because it will, take a lot of resources to be able to finish it and may cause, like it could become that noisy neighbor uh, to be able to do it. I think it's... So now it's it's finished. Now we can display the results. So we're gonna display results one by one. First one was just doing the pure page rank basically to show who is most influential person in our connections. The Charlie is the most influential. It has a page rank of 3.08, followed by Gab. And then uh, everyone else is um, uh, a lot less influential based on the page ranking. And you can uh, follow the same thing, kind of like have the same understanding based on the graph, because if we uh, find Charlie, so you can see that Charlie has probably the most connections, but everyone else is probably on par. And the second one is Gab. Yeah, that's that's probably second most connections and, and, and so on and forth. Uh, but the other ones who don't have as many connections or maybe like about the same connections, you can actually still differentiate between them based on the page ranking. Uh, the other probably more important thing is when you start looking towards biases, uh, you can actually define that if we bias with specific connection to specific person, now we can actually reset. And it's not just pure uh, number of connections, but there is also a value in connections themselves, uh, depending on the type of uh, edges or other factors within the edges. Uh, and then the last one is uh, uh, page ranking with uh, based on the array. So this is where uh, you can actually see the breakdown of the values. Uh, so it's it's personalizing based on the um, rankings against the other three. So it's it's uh, uh, personalized rankings. This is probably could be used in like recommendation engines, uh, where you can do those deep recommendations based on the other connections, uh, which can be sourced in uh, based on the previous results. Scroll down. Uh, and, and the other thing based on the results is also you have the weight of relationships. So that's another thing you can do from the ranking uh, where it's not just a difference on how you rank the vertices. You also can uh, define uh, what type of relationships matter. For example, in our case, uh, friends uh, uh, between like I and B, I and B um, uh, people with those IDs, France is, has weight one, but when you have multiple types of relationships, uh, they can actually be different, right? So the uh, D, for example, has uh, different relationships for friend and follow because they have like two ones. But when you have many others, you can have different values for weights. And you can use it uh, when you actually use it like in Aquarius because now you can assign weight back to relationship as a property <clears throat> and use it as additional filtering choice. And the last... Uh, Last thing we want to look at is, uh, is how to use our shortest path uh, algorithm to uh, define the uh, 
defines uh, how many hops you have between the different uh, different vertices. So in that case, um, uh, we use uh, uh, G to A and C. Basically, we use A and C and evaluate against every other one if there is a connection, right? So we can see that G is connected to C with a one hop. Uh, C obviously connected to itself, there are zero hops. And I connected to A with two hops and C three hops and so on and so forth. And that's how you can use it. Um, and you can also um, display it as a pass. Basically, if you explode those distances and just use it for pure calculation values, then you can just dis display the value to make it as a representative. And you can then order by or filter by additional properties. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, all the examples of uh, how you can use GraphFrame uh, library and Spark and, uh, and Synapse Analytics uh, Cosmos Synapse link to explore Cosmos graph data, uh, online transactional graph data for different analytical use cases and potentially apply them to your analytical needs uh, from business. Uh, and then you have choices either write the results back to Cosmos DB for additional queries or potentially present it as a uh, through Spark tables to be available for queries in your uh, presentation layer. So we look at the demo. So now let's uh, let's do a wrap with with three takeaways. Um, what we what we learn show today is. Uh, there are differences between transactional OLTP and analytical OLAP graph use cases, and there are different methods to execute them. Uh, we explored uh, Azure Cosmos DB and Synapse Link integration, uh, specifically with uh, Gremlin API uh, and Spark. Uh, and uh, we uh, looked, uh, zoom in a little bit on Spark Graph Frames library and some examples on how to use it to explore graph data in Cosmos Gremlin API for analytical use cases. And hopefully this, uh, will uh, spark some ideas how you can leverage your graph data uh, for to solve in other problems uh, with uh, Synapse Analytics and Spark. Um, so thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.